Alright, so I'm talking about love. Love. What do we know about love? Love. So Emma Goldman, the one that told me that I learned my understanding about love. You give yourself completely to somebody. That's how you love is when you give yourself completely to somebody. So Emma Goldman, who's an anarchist. Emma Goldman. She's, um, according to Wikipedia, right, and professors always fucking bitch about Wikipedia. But Wikipedia, I get so much information from. Emma Goldman was an anarchist known for her political activism, writing, and speeches. She lived from 1869 to 1940. She played a pivotal role in the development of anarchist political philosophy in North America and Europe in the first half of the 20th century. Born in Kovno in the Russian Empire, present-day colonist, Lithuania, Goldman immigrated to the U.S. in 1885, lived in New York City, where she joined the burgeoning anarchist movement in 1889. Attracted to anarchism after the Haymarket Affair, Goldman became a writer and a renowned lecturer on anarchist philosophy, women's rights, and social issues, attracting crowds of thousands. She and anarchist writing writer Alexander Berkman, her lover and lifelong friend, planned to assassinate industrialist and financier Henry Clay Frick as an act of propaganda of the deed. And fuck Henry Clay Frick. That's a, he's a frickin' fucking dickhead. Henry Clay Frick. He was a uh, he was responsible for killing a lot of people. I want to say a Pullman industry or I don't know. He's a fuck fuck Frick. The Homestead Strike. Carnegie and uh, Andrew Carnegie's. Carnegie Steel Corporation in uh, Pennsylvania, the Homestead Steel Strike. Frick was in charge of the, the, the Pinkertons, the fucking Pinkertons, fucking frickin' Pinkertons, fucking Frick's fucking freaking fucking Pinkerton. <laughs> so Frick's Pinkers, Pinkertons army came and killed a bunch of people in Homestead, Pennsylvania when they were striking. He's a dick. Fuck Henry Clay Frick. So... Um, she and anarchist writer Alexander Berkman uh, were going to assassinate this financier, Henry Clay Frick. And Frick uh, survived the attempt on his life, and Berkman was sentenced to 22 years in prison. So, Berkman froze up and then eventually didn't kill Frick. Goldman was in prison several years in the years, uh, several times in the years that followed for inciting to riot and illegally distributing information about birth control. So she was uh, for birth control and way in front of out and every she was in front of everybody. She was even for homosexuality before everybody. This is 1900s to the turn of the century. Um, so she is for birth control at the turn of the century. Santorum's not even for birth control today in 2012. Goldman in 1906 founded the anarchist journal Mother Earth. In 1917, Goldman and Berkman were sentenced to two years in jail for conspiring to induce persons not to register for the newly instated draft. After their release from prison, they were arrested along with hundreds of others and deported to Russia. So... Goldman was sent and deported to Russia, which is uh, fantastic, I think, in 1970 because she was telling people not to join uh, the draft. So the draft for the war, which the draft is illegal. There's no fucking draft today because Mike Gravel, he filibustered the draft, and there's, so, no, there's no boots on the ground today all over the world because we are not forced to be in the military. It's an all-volunteer army, and the Republicans won't. Uh, you know, stop talking about how it's an all-volunteer army. That You need po poor people. There's lots of struggling working-class people who go into the army because it's a good-ass job, but it shouldn't be the only opportunity that is faced with poor people, especially in Appalachia. In Appalachia, you got the choice of going to the military or selling drugs. If you're in Appalachia, that's your choice for a living, you know. So they don't, they have limited options. All volunteer army? Yeah, sure, because you're fucking poor, so you're forced to, you know, kill whoever your president tells you to kill. But even then, 
Obedience and morality are the opposite. So it's okay to be obedient, but you got to maintain some modicum of individuality. You've got to. So 1917, Goldman Berkman are sentenced to two years in jail for conspiring to induce persons not to register for the newly instated draft. Eugene Debs, he went to prison for 10 years for speaking out against World War One. Eugene Debs, a socialist who ran for president, went to prison for 10 fucking years for speaking out against the war. So, Goldman and Berkman sentenced to two years for conspiring to induce persons not to register for the newly instated draft. After their release from prison, they were arrested along with hundreds of others and deported to Russia. So, go back to Russia, you know, Berkman and Goldman. But that's uh, 1906, so I guess eventually he got out. He was... Uh, uh, 22 years uh, he's supposed to stay in jail. I don't know if he actually stayed in all 22 years, but he eventually got out and they were together again. Um, initially supportive of that country's Bolshevik revolution, Goldman quickly voiced her opposition to the Soviet use of violence and the repression of independent voices. So uh, Goldman was for the Bolshevik, uh, the Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin revolution. Um, but just like many other people, the violence and the repression afterwards that where Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky forced everybody to their beliefs was against their notions. So good that you're socialist, good that you took over the country, uh, bad that you were killing everybody and sending them to gulags and, um, and prison camps and uh, killing your, your political opponents. These are, these are bad things. You, these are not good things. These are bad things, right? So, in 1923, Emma Goldman wrote a book about her experience, My Disillusionment, uh, Disillusionment in Russia. While living in England, Canada, and France, she wrote an autobiography called Living My Life. At the, uh, after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, she traveled to Spain to support the anarchist revolution there. She died in Toronto on May 14, 1940, uh, at age 70 years old. During her life, Goldman was lionized as a free-thinking rebel woman by a admirers and derided by critics as an advocate of politically motivated murder and violent revolution. Her writing and lectures spanned a wide variety of issues, including prisons, atheism, freedom of speech, militarism, capitalism, marriage, free love, and homosexuality. Although she distanced herself from the first wave feminism and its efforts towards women's suffrage, she developed new ways of incorporating gender politics into anarchism. After decades of obscurity, Goldman's iconic status was revived in the 1970s when feminist and anarchist scholars rekindled popular interest in her life. So Emma, Emma Goldman, she's a great anarchist. She inspired, I think, I want to say she inspired uh, Eugene Debs. She might have actually inspired Guteau. <laughs> Um, but um, Emma Goldman, I like. I feel like I hold Emma Goldman in the same esteem that I hold with a lot of the thinkers in that time period. She's an anarchist, which is the opposite of socialism, right? If you want to talk literally about what it is. But right now in America, the anarchists and the socialists have a lot of things that they have in common. Both are against the war. Both are against the Patriot Act. Both. Uh, want the uh, uh, war on drugs to be ended. Both want the uh, budget to be balanced. Both want the Fed to be either audited or to be ended. Right? So that's the far right and the far left. That's your anarchists and your socialists. And when your anarchists and your socialists are agreeing on five major policy issues, that's when you know things are fucked up. And in fact, uh, Ron Paul, one of the constitutional and the libertarians and the greens and the uh, Socialist and Nader and Independents all get together and point out that they have these five major policy issues which they all agree on. They all agree on it. They're all against the war, the Empire Wars. They're all against the Patriot Act, so curbing excessive police powers for Homeland Security and any law enforcement body. And uh, against the war on drugs, it's a failed policy. We should decriminalize it, legalize it, and tax it. Put it out there in the public. Sell just like you do alcohol. Keep out of the reach of children. So you have a red light district. The same place where the strip clubs are, that's where you're going to have weed shops. The same place where you sell alcohol, that's the same place you're going to have pot shops. So it would be in the same spot, the same exact way. You're going to have liquor everywhere, and you're not going to have pot. If you want a free and happy country in a, a, a peace and loving world, you would legalize pot. Legalize pot, especially Kentucky. So no more one cash crop in Kentucky. 70%, according to Cha-Cha. <laughs> 
text messaging service says 70% of America's weed comes out of Appalachia. So, Kentucky, we've been growing marijuana and tobacco since the very beginning. Kentucky, we've been growing marijuana since the very beginning. It's what kept this state alive. It's what kept America alive. Jamestown would have gone down if it wasn't for the tobacco crop. Tobacco, marijuana, we're still raising it. It's still here. We haven't stopped raising it. Legalize it. The bluegrass state is the fucking bluegrass state. Give me a fucking break. It's been the bluegrass state the whole fucking time. It's been nothing but grass. Bluegrass. Dark and bloody ground. I'm not sure what that, oh, I threw that in there, but in the, from the very beginning, since, uh, okay, not very beginning, I guess, since the white people brought the uh, tobacco and hemp, but they uh, they were able to survive their colonies because of the tobacco and the hemp crops. Constitution's written on hemp paper. I can, I can talk about hemp forever. <laughs> Um, and yeah, it is industrious. It's a rope, paper, a go uh, gasoline, and oil uh, cures cancer. It cures cancer. Hemp oil has been known to cure cancer. How the fuck can you not legalize it after you hear that shit? Did your mom die of cancer? Do you give a fuck about your mom? Then legalize pot so that way she could have not died of cancer. Plus, who... Uh, when did we lose the right to our own bodies? We're Americans. It's time for Americans to start acting like Americans. It's time for Americans to start being Americans again. We have a long tradition of being rebels and being warriors and being rabble rousers and to standing up and to shaking the system and to rattling the cages and to make sure people know when we are not happy and satisfied. We got a right to bitch. And even, even then, it doesn't seem like enough people bitch enough. Politics should be common water cooler talk. We should be talking about so many fucking things all the time in a democracy, in a real democracy. So, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> that's who Emma Goldman is. She's this, uh, this heroic anarchist person, and she wrote a lot of things about love. She's got this article called uh, Marriage and Love, and she claims that marriage and love are the exact opposites. Uh, I want to explore that. I want to check out a lot of her quotes. She's got, uh, here's some Emma Goldman quotes. She says, all claims of education notwithstanding, the pupil will accept only that which his mind create his mind craves. So, you'll only learn if your mind craves to learn it. And if your mind doesn't want to learn it and you're not curious about it, you're not actually learning it. Don't think you can force people to do shit and that they're actually learning it. All the word learning is that when you force and twist our arm, we become fucking obedient assholes, and I'm so I'm tired of that lesson. I've seen that lesson over and over again. You got the Sanford prison experiments, and you got the uh, uh, Milgram's obedience experiments, and then you got that woman out of Fort Washington. I think it's Fort Washington in Kentucky. This is definitely a Kentucky story where the uh, a guy from Florida, from a prison in Florida, a prison guard called on a payphone and says, "I'm a cop." And you need to strip search a woman in your shop because she stole a purse. And they do this. They strip search this woman because a person over the phone said that they were a cop. That's how obedient people are. And now you got devil's breath. So you just blow this little powder into someone's drink to where they smell it. They ingest it somehow and they lose all... All their senses. When people smell devil's breath, breath, it's big in Colombia and it's big in Latin America. It's only going to be a matter of time before it gets here. People are like taking their own shit out of their house. And they remember doing all this. They remember having no control over their own will and their own power to do things. And so they're sitting there grabbing things and they're just carrying all their furniture out of their house and uh, emptying their banks, bank accounts. And they're giving it to the people that give them the devil's breath and they lose all, everything that they have because somebody would was able to trick him with his devil's breath. So, uh, Emma Goldman, before we can forgive one another, we have to understand one another. Crime is not but misdirected energy. Direct action is the logical, consistent method of anarchism. Um, Women of Valor, I got this short article, I guess I will read first off, coming back. Eight entirely new ideas about love out of the Oprah magazine. So I guess lots of people have their understandings about love. I'm getting a better understanding from love just doing this here. Um, I hope to work out whether or not obedience is a part of love or if it is not. Is that something I made up or is that something that is real? 
should we be obedient to each other or should we always be independent and there should there always be a tussle? I don't know.